It's the WSN Podcast, The Three Wise Men. I'm Danny Holbrook alongside Miles Holiday and Nate Garlock. And our special guest this afternoon is football official Jim Epperly. Jim, thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you asking me. Absolutely. So we, we've been talking about officials the last couple of weeks, and we've got so many questions we want to ask you, and, and it was Miles' idea to bring an official on. So let's just start out. <laughs> Miles, do you want to talk about the defensive receiver? Because uh, you had a well, lot of questions about that. I, there's a ton of questions, Jim. First and foremost, uh, really thank you for being an official, right? Um, I coached in Ohio. I coached in Michigan. I coached in Tennessee. And I've always tried to figure out, when you guys are at a game, who watches the seeing eye dogs? <laughs> <laughs> like, when, when, so when he said he wanted to bring yeah. one an official on, the fact that you were like, "Oh, I'll bring a friend of mine," yeah. I was like, "This is gonna be horrible. This is a terrible yeah, idea." T- like, yeah. what are you doing? He's a very respected. Well, man. Like, I, I, I've known Jim a long time. Like, this was why would you do this to this man? Just you know, teasing Jim. Just teasing. Our our response to you would be, you know, <laughs> why you know why did you why did you call the play that got stuffed on fourth down? You know, we weren't mad when you did that. So. I told you he was going to fire back. I told you. I love it, Jim. That's great. Oh, great question. Well, all right. um, so I, I do have a question because sure. this has been, you know, we've talked about a couple of different things. I think most famously because it made its way around Facebook and stuff was the defenseless receiver. It seems, it seems like that is something new here in the last year or so that has started to take shape. It seems like it's a very difficult penalty to, to throw we, we've seen incidents where it's you know one official says well that's not how I see it one says that is how I see it we saw them get together in the one hit in week one and decide to throw the flag I think a lot of people just don't know that it exists though at the high school level now well I think what you're looking at and and one of the things that people have to understand is the game of football is evolving um the hits of 20 years ago where you're ear holing a guy or you know you're hunting somebody down and decleating them those hits are going to be taken out of the game because they're their injury they're injury riddled they're concussion they they lead to lawsuits they've led to a lot of negative aspects to the game of football you know we've all been around the the you know we want kids to participate in sports and one of the hardest sports to get people to participate in sometimes is football Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons is is there's inherent there's an inherent nature of violence to the game we want at least what the uh, parameters of the game they want the game to still maintain its toughness but take away things that are not football related. So the defenseless receiver, defenseless player, period. I mean, receiver is what we hear. It's a defenseless player. That's it a could, good point. It could be a receiver. It could be a, a kick, catch, returner, mm-hmm. um, kid just out of the play, period. And what they're trying to take out of the game is actions that are not part of the game, you know, is, is what I'm saying. So is it part of the game for... Uh, a receiver to go up after a pass, go off his fingertips, and then he's in a position where he can't protect himself, and a defender comes in and cleans him out just to uh, inflict punishment. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's kind of what they're looking at. You know, we went to a concussion protocol, I think five years ago or more, where uh, it's it was mandated by the legislature, not even by the OHSAA or the NFHS. The two, uh, actually, our game is governed by the NFHS, it's National Federation of High Schools, and uh, they set the rules, and then the states can make adjustments and add things, but the basis comes from the national federation and this defenseless player is one that has and you're going you're seeing it at the at the pro level at the at the college level you know it started with the blindside blocks that's been about four years ago right uh, where you see the blindside blocks and now you see that at the at the pro level well you don't see it as much at the pro level but again they're trying to take it out where you see it at the pro level is hits on the quarterback it's not a whole lot different than the hits on the quarterback. A lot of people say, well, you know, put a skirt on him. <laughs> well, one of the reasons that they are trying to take those away is because, you know, it, it's a money game at that level. I came, my, you know, my kids and I paid 100 bucks a seat to watch Joe Burrow play, not Joe Burrow's backup. That's a good point. And if Joe Burrow gets hurt because somebody dove and tried to take his knee out when it wasn't a football play, that's costing us money. Um, with the defenseless player... 
uh, what you're asking about and what I told Danny about was we kind of try and teach our officials to view a situation and try and put it in a category. Okay, so with a defenseless player, we have three letters that uh, our director of officiating development has kind of put together, and those three letters are POW. Okay, and we want that hit to fall into one of those three categories. The P being that he is playing the ball. In other words, if you're going after the football with the receiver and there's contact, that's a different story. Okay, so playing the ball is one of them. The second one is open hands. The O stands for open hands. If I have my hands open and I'm trying to, you know, push that receiver or do something that way, that kind of lessens that blow. And, and again, that goes with that playing the ball. And then the last one's W. I want to see a wrap. Are you trying to wrap him up? Or are you trying to tackle him? Or, as many of you know, and many of you get frustrated watching college defensive backs throw their shoulder at a running back and right, bounce off right, of right. him without wrapping up, and right. you'll hear him screaming from the sideline, wrap him up. So we're looking at what's a football play. So, you know, you mentioned a play earlier this year, and I'm very familiar with that play because we've discussed it at length. Um, when you slow it down, it looks weird, but did it fit any one of those three categories? Was the defender playing the ball? Did he have open hands? Did he try and wrap up the receiver who was up in the air? No. No. So then, therefore, that is a suspect defenseless player call. I mean, some of them are going to call themselves. Some of them, we all know the minute it happens that there ought to be a flag. Right. You know, and it's also, you know, besides us, it's on the onus of the coaches to teach your kids to do it the right way. Mm. You know, we can't. Uh, one of the things that I found out, and I coached for 35 years, one of the things that I found out was the, the stronger my kids were and the better they did things, the better it seemed officiating was because we were able to play through things. Mm -hmm. um, football's the same way. It's a game of strength and speed. So with that defenseless receiver, defenseless player, period, you know, you think about it. How do you want your defensive back to play that offensive player or vice versa it's the same way you know if you're in a vulnerable position what's you know what how have you been taught to bring them to the ground did you were you taught to bring them to ground by taking your head and sticking their your head in the middle of their chest and driving them into the ground you know, so it, it, that's kind of where we are with that defensive player. I hope that answers your question. Great, yeah, great answer. I, honestly, I the that, pow, that, yeah, the POW really, I mean, that really made it very clear. I think for a lot of people who were, you know, it's arbitrary, right? They feel like it's a in the moment, just kind of how you feel type of situation. But now if you look at it as POW and you look at it with those three things, it really does make a lot of other hits clear when you're like, well, there was that, so there's no flag. There was none of those things. That's why it, what led to a flag. Like mm -hmm. it, it, that really does help. That so w when there's a discussion with the officials, like you, you see it right, the flag is thrown, and then the white hat gets the guy together, and they're talking. Is that someone that's going on in the, in the conversation? Like, what did you see? Did you see him play the ball? Did you see him with open hands? Did you see him try to wrap? Because a lot of times you'll have that really long discussion, right? Is that mm -hmm. what's going on at that time? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, anytime there's a flag or if there are two flags, we are taught to get together and make sure that we're both on the same page. Okay. Um, and one of the best ways to question a call, in other words, if there's one flag, if, if we are looking and we have different keys, uh, I'm an umpire most of the time, so I'm the guy in with the linebackers. And, okay. you know, so I have the guards in the center, mostly what they do. Right. Mostly I run for my life. But. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, you're real quick, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so if, if I happen to throw a flag and one of our other guys is looking at that point of attack area and he questions, like, what I'm throwing it for, for he's going to come to me and he'll go, and his first question will be exactly what you said. His first question will be, what did you see? And then he's, you know, I'm going to give him my information. And whatever penalty we have, we do have, just like Powell, we have categories that we want to put it in. Mm -hmm. There are categories. Is it a hook and turn? Did he play through the receiver? Mm -hmm. um, did he get to the ball early? So, again, when you throw that flag, we're looking at here's the category. Now, what a lot of you guys are doing, and 
we have the categories, which is great, and this is a discussion we've had, and we've had these discussions a lot with some of our younger officials. It, it's not black and white. Right. There's still right. judgment involved. Absolutely. I mean, all we're doing is giving you parameters, and then you're going to put it in one of those parameters. Now, you may see it at slow motion and go, hmm, that's not what it looked like in regular motion. We don't have the benefit of point. eight officials. We don't have the benefit of replay to make those calls. We need to make that call in the moment at that time. Right. And in the moment at that time, I felt like it fit one of those categories. I had a tripping call on a kickoff in the first game of the season. Yeah. Was there? Um, there was a kickoff that went for a touchdown and I saw tripping. And then what goes for the touchdown, now I'm going, mm, did I see what I thought I saw? Now, luckily, it turned out on tape that it actually was. Um, but most of the time, if we question, we're probably not going to throw a flag. Mm. In fact, we're taught when in doubt, we have a whole list of when in doubts. Because at the beginning of the season, we get three manuals, basically. We get a case book, which has plays in it and you know, certain plays that we would have to go through. We get the rules book, which has the rules. There's 10 categories of rules. There's rule one rule through rule 10. And we get, this is an Ohio specific, which is, it's called the gold book and it's a mechanics book. But in the gold book also, we have little helpfuls, like our overtime period is different than the rest of the rest of the states. Um, and we have a page that is called when in doubt. Okay, and when it's when in doubt, we're listed. When in doubt, it's not pass interference. When in doubt, it's, it's, you know, it's not a safety, stuff like that. Anytime it's a when in doubt, you don't want to make an effect. Okay. Now, do you guys take those things with you? To yeah, we have one on the we, we, right? we have these on the field in a bag right, somewhere. Right, just in case. Well, and coaches can request a conference. Okay. Now, here's, here's the issue with it. Some coaches, they want to request all a conference time, right? all the time yeah. to complain about a call. Sure. What we have to tell them is this, and, and you want to word it correctly. Coach, we will give you a conference and get a rule book for a misapplication of the rules. However, if, it was, if it's found that the rule was not misapplied, you are going to be charged a timeout. Yeah, yeah. And that's usually when they don't want to talk about it anymore. Sure. Yeah. So a lot of times what I'm hearing in the crowd and from the public is the inconsistency from one crew to the next. And what I, why I'm bringing that up, it brings my next topic. Do you think because of the shortage of officials, we're rushing guys up to the varsity level? And I, you know, we laugh about that because you know you don't get a lot of experience in junior high and JV, which I think you should. But are we are we moving guys up too quick? Um, possibly, you know. But you also have to think. You, you say inconsistency. I say that it's uh, differences in philosophies. <laughs> Rules should be consistently enforced, and that's that's not not an issue. Yeah. But but there are there are some crews that. Things happen a little quicker or a little slower or, you know, and that's kind of why the 42nd clock came in. Used to be the, the referee blew the play into, blew the ball ready for play every play. And the time was varying between the time it was down and the time. So the 42nd clock brought that in. So right. that's that attempt to be more consistent. But, you know, you talk about inconsistent and Sometimes our judgments are what you see is not what I see. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I work on the sideline, which I'll be doing here in a couple of weeks, um, always want to ask coach, co when coach has a question, you know, hey, there's holding. Okay, coach, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Who's holding? Who got held? And where's it at? Right, because they just see a Because you, yeah. you may not be looking at the same thing I'm looking at, and you may not be looking at the others. And if you can't give me those, then you're not trying to work with me. Yeah. You're just trying to show me up. Right. A lot of coaches don't understand, it, it took me a long time when I was coaching, what officials' responsibility is, right? So you mm -hmm. might be yelling at the wrong official who that's not his call, correct? Um, it could be, but if you're on my sideline, then I'm going to be your communicator. Okay. So you talk to me, and then I'll talk to whoever 
that should be looking at that and get that done for you because it's we're not going to have uh, a, a great game if you're standing behind me yelling <laughs> at my, over my shoulder at the guy clear on the other side of the field. Now the game will be okay is if you talk to me and then I go talk to that guy and we'll get we'll get things taken care of. So going back to my original point, what what do we have to do to get more officials in the game? Because it is a huge. I mean, we're seeing scheduling being revolving around officials. Well, we're seeing night game versus day game, so other crews can get there. To I mean, it, this is this is the worst I've ever seen it as far as the number it, of officials. Well, I'm it's a going. Great I'm going to tell you, sell job on it, right? Yeah. yeah, it's it's going to get worse before it gets better. I'm 62 years or 61 years old. It'll be 62 years old. I know of two crews that within the next four years probably will not be available anymore mm. because, you know, one of them has two guys who are 70 on it. it you know, it's time. Right. Um, I think the, uh, the landscape has changed a little bit uh, because there are so many things and uh, there are so little reward to it. I mean, when you look at it from a younger person's stand, standpoint, you know, why do I want to go out there on the field and get yelled at by everybody, mm. you know, whether I call it right or call it wrong, um, and get paid $90, and I have to be on the game site at 530, and I don't leave the game site until 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah, right. That people don't realize that. Right. right. People, and if I even even if I have seven. to drive. Yeah. I mean, because we we used to work in the track and usually in the track we would have Toledo Whitmer and Central Catholic, True. which is a great game. Right. But we have to leave at four o'clock to get up there and we're not getting back till midnight and we're getting paid eighty five, ninety dollars a guy. Um, now you know, there there are guys that travel, and that, and that's fine. But we live in an area right now where we are a bit at a bit of a dearth of officials, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, for example, we're talking about uh, one of our crews, Jeff Klaus's crew, went to six guys. We went to six guys mm -hmm. a couple years ago. Well, we haven't been able to work six for quite a real Jeff's Jeff's loaning out a guy next week for a crew he loaned me a guy one week because I had a guy who had a rib injury and wasn't able to go and when somebody has like a, a family function or something where they have to miss a night I got one of my guys is going to ACC baseball clinic he's an umpire in the ACC okay. next weekend so I've, I'm finding a guy for him well I found a guy who's going to go who volunteered to go with us next Friday up to defiance um, so around here, you know, it's, it's, it's tough and we're, we're kind of shifting people around to get into places and we're giving young guys a chance because there are three young guys in Wapak who have been officiating. And when I say young guys, they're college kids. They're mm. second year of college who started officiating when they were in junior high. Um, so they're, I mean, and, and they want to work when they can, but one's going to the University of Cincinnati, one's at Dayton and one's at Finley. Yeah. Now, you know, I can't have Kyle coming back from Cincinnati every Friday night to work with us, you know. So, but the, when he comes back, we take him as a six guy or we take the, the other young guy as a six guy. And I know the kid from Finley is going to be working tomorrow night or this weekend over in western Ohio with the crew because he's needed. Right. So the, the Ohio wants to have six-man crews, right? Yeah, and, and the six-man crew came from the coaches. Okay. The coaches were upset about low blocks yeah. and holds on the edge. And when we're talking low blocks, we're talking not offense, not just offense, we're talking defense. Mm -hmm. Defense taken out pulling guards like St. Mary's and uh, Marion Local when they run the wing or they run the, the fullback and you have a linebacker or a defensive back who sees on Saturday or sees on uh, Sunday where that cornerback comes in and shoots their legs out right. and takes that blocker out. Well, that's illegal in high school. That's a 15-yard block below the waist. Um, and it's either offense or defense that can commit that. And those were happening on the edges and – that's what the coaches wanted. So putting that center judge, that second guy in the backfield, was the reason for that. On a kickoff, he's on the 50-yard line because now we have two officials on the receiver's line in case of onside kicks. 
I've always wanted the answer the, an answer to this question. So I watch officials in baseball, and we know how they handle umpires, how they handle managers, mm-hmm. and they're quick to throw them out. We see it in basketball. How much does it? I mean, you guys do a lot of talking to the coaches on the sidelines, and the wing I mean, guys do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the wing guys, the sideline guys, because that's kind of your guy. Yeah, um, you know, the, and and the better you are at handling those guys on the sideline, the better, the smoother the game's going to go. And we've always used the uh, it, when we teach our teach our young guys and teach our wings, we always use the uh, Patrick Swayze theory. You guys watch be roadies. Nice. Oh yeah, be nice, yeah. Be nice until be nice it's time until to not be nice. Until it's but time I've to not saw be the nice. Officials, the, the football officials always seem like they they take handle more. it. They take more, yeah. but they always handle it. So, I mean, you you you'll see a flag go up on an unsportsmanlike conduct on a coach every I've, once in a while, I've but not very one. often. You know, <laughs> just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a different. Think about your atmospheres with those. Yeah. I mean, the number of calls that are made in a baseball or basketball game. The uh, area involved, the tightness and the emotion and everything like that. Football, one of the things, and, and the great coaches, the great coaches understand that that was one play. I've got to get back in to getting on to this next play. And right. they're calling a play every 40 seconds. You're not calling a play every 40 seconds in basketball. You know, you're running your – offense or whatever baseball is you know i was a college baseball player i apologize but baseball is a slow game it is. Uh, i'm gonna sneak this in go royals <laughs> <laughs> home of the guardians <laughs> um so yeah I, I mean and and there are just as there is in any walk of life there are guys who are really good at it on the sideline there are guys who need some work on the sideline at it um right. one of the things that you do is you kind of have to take your ego out of it, I guess, is what I want to say. Um, You can't get your feelings hurt because you made a call and they're not happy with it. Um, You want to try and keep an open line of communication because once that line of communication is gone, then you're really going to have trouble because the players always take their cues from their coaches. However their coach acts, their player is going to act most of the time. So if you can, you know, if you can handle and control the coaches, then the players are also, you know, that game goes so much better than it would. Um, you know, our, our, our biggest thing is we have coaches out there who are very good with the rules and they know the rules. Unfortunately, we also have coaches out there that are not as good with the rules. Um, they watch a lot of Saturday, they watch a lot of Sunday, and that's what the fans are. But we understand that. I mean, fans are going to be fans, whatever, whatever you are. And you ask about the dearth of officials, you know, that's another thing. Fan treatment of officials uh, is one of the things that is beyond, beyond, ask midget programs how much they're paying to get officials to come work for them because of, you know, they're, because of, again, where I say it, there's a lack of knowledge of the rules. And I'm not saying these people are bad people. But they make bad they decisions. They get caught up in it. They make bad decisions. And, and they, you know, they treat those officials like, and, and the worst part is, is for a lot of them, those are the young officials. Those are the guys that haven't had a chance to get up that are doing those so that they can practice and get better. And then when, you know, when they're getting run off the field by parents and, and, Coaches, right. I'm glad it's a video. <laughs> um, you know that's screaming at them an, an entire Sunday afternoon. Uh, why do I want to do this on Friday night again? So, you know? so what do you think we can do? Uh, can do? I mean, obviously, we know that it's a problem and there's a shortage. But if we want high school sports to be able to continue like we know it, we have to find a way of getting the ranks filled back up. If, if I had the answer to that question, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> yeah. well, well, I mean, let, let me ask you this. What was attractive to you that got you into officiating? Well, I didn't start it until I was about 40 years old. Okay. So, um, and what got me into it was I was coaching junior high football with a friend of mine, Ted Endel. Ted and I were coaching, and Ted had just gotten his basketball license to officiate basketball. And he said, why don't we, do, why don't we get a football officiating license? So took the class, which that has changed a ton because of trying to recruit more people. Then it was you went to nine hours of classroom. And then you had to do two years of 
JV and under before you could do a varsity game. Uh, now they've done away with the classroom segment. It's all online. Okay. Um, and uh, now it's just one year. You need to be observed by two class one officials. There's three classes of officials. Class one, which is varsity. Class two, which is everything but varsity. And class three, which is uh, like high school kids who are officiating. A lot of the schools in Ohio have gone to teaching officiating classes as part of their phys ed curriculum. Love it. Yep. Yeah. Great idea. It, it's a great idea. However, that it's not panning out as to those kids going on and doing it once they get out of high school because mm. they don't get field time during high school, which is really difficult to do. I mean, I've been in a couple. I spoke to Shawnee's classes. Uh, Nick Berkey's teaching them. He's doing a phenomenal job because he does, like, game simulations um, and has it all written out. Things like that is great. Uh, we've we've taken them to do our midgets a couple times where they've been kind of in a controlled atmosphere where they can see it. But a lot of times they, they end up going off to college. So, for example, we'll take the, the young man who's in Cincinnati. Um, he's been given an assigner down there. Well, the assigner keeps assigning him games on days when he's not really available, oh. you know. And making him make a choice between going to a University of Cincinnati football game, which he has season tickets to, or going and doing a junior high <laughs> afternoon game nice. for for fifty five or sixty dollars. Now, as a high, as a college kid, I know what decision I'm making. Yeah. Oh That's, yeah. I mean, for sure. I, you know, I'm I'm there for the experience. Now, is it is it a good chance to make some extra money in college? Heck yeah. But, you know, it, it needs to be something that you desire to do and kind of getting along there. So um, I would say the average age of a football official in the state of Ohio is over 55. Wow. I would guess. It, it's got to be in the 50s somewhere. So the, I'm assuming one of the things you do like, because you mentioned that you know you got involved because you had friends that wanted to officiate too, the camaraderie and the group uh, dynamic oh, of, of working yeah. with those guys, certainly. right? That, that's working be... with your friends, yeah. That's right. a. I mean, we're on the phone constantly, and not as much my crew, but me and some other guys on different crews discussing rules, discussing plays that right. we've had, sending plays back and forth, because we we honestly do want to do a good job and I, they all want to do a good job yeah i, I was going to ask you that right because everybody always assumes right that you guys are just bozos and just show up don't do any training right that's not the case you guys have meetings throughout the season mm -hmm. right to, to work on your craft and uh, jim you guys really don't care who wins do you i a lot of times i can't tell you what the score is exactly <laughs> right. Right. oh it's, i take that back I know when it's over 30. <laughs> when how one many, team has 30 more than the other. I do know how that. How many times a year do, do you guys evaluate every game after the game? Do you, how many meetings do you have to go? I mean, is there still procedure during the season? Um, high school's not like college and pros. Um, we'll just we'll take college, for example, yeah. and uh, talk, with, you know, talk with Dr. Denny sometime. He would be a good yeah. one for you to talk to about what they go through. But, you know, they're graded every time. They have conference calls during the week to go over calls that they've made and their calls will be graded on you know whether it's a correct call or whether it is a gray area or whether it's an incorrect call uh, and you don't want gray area or incorrect you want all correct um, for us on Friday nights you know you have to understand this is not our one job sure you know some of us Besides having uh, our daytime job, may al we also have a family with kids of our own that are doing things. So getting a lot of time to review a lot of those things is not, um, a, not a lot of times in the cards. Now, we are required to attend one state interpretation meeting, which is at the beginning of the year, and the coaches are required to also. And then we are required to uh, accumulate four more what are called educational credits. And the way that you gain educational credits is you attend local association rules meetings. So we have a local association here in Lima. We have about 70 officials in it, and we meet four times a year. Okay. Um, and 
so at that meeting, um, I'm, I'm our rules interpreter, so I will do a presentation on a rule and plays, and I will have video, and we'll go through video, and we'll look at it and say, okay, you know, here's what we looked at, what do you think, what category does it go into, what would be the enforcements, and then we'll branch off of it. What if this would have happened? How do you handle this? We try and do things that are more commonplace instead of the odd ruling that you'll run into once in a lifetime. You know, I've been officiating 24 years. You know how many times I've called Tripping Danny? <laughs> <laughs> Not very often. Once. And it was the game and I when, had. When I, and when I threw the flag, <laughs> when I threw the flag, I went, that almost looked like a leg, leg whip. And I'm like, I'm really going to throw the flag. And I threw it. And, you know, and I, when I went to Carl, I said, you're going to love this, but this is what I have. Um, Conrad but what, Dobler. But we're tr what we're trying to uh, get is, is try and get the regular play and get regular things and, and not make mistakes on enforcements and things like that. Judgment will always have its uh, barrel of where you see it differently than I see it. Mm -hmm. But if it's a 10-yard penalty and you give them five yards on it, that's human. That's an error that needs to be corrected. Let me ask you about a play that took place uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, I, it was all over social media. Did you see the field goal between Tenora and Archbold at the end of the game? Barely did we, it go over the crossbar. We did see did, it, yeah. and we uh, we discussed it last night at our rules uh, at our rules meeting. They <laughs> they put it up. They put it up and talked about it. And and again, we are we're on our side. I mean, we're always, uh, you guys remember Doug Foley. Doug, mm -hmm, yeah, Doug was a coach for a long time, and then he got his football officiating license, and he made a complaint one night to me, and I said, you have to, you have to understand one thing. Doug, you're either one of them or one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Cutthroat. <laughs> so when we discuss, okay, we are going to support the call that's made. Sure by them but we are going to try and learn if we see that th that there was a mistake or that that it was an incorrect call as to how not to do that again right um so we talked about positioning under the goalposts. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was when we look on the film we see lots of people in the area of the goalposts. why do we have kids and and people that close mm -hmm. could be a distraction to you um are you standing directly under the bar? You know, can you see the bar? Did you follow the football all the way across the bar? You know, things like that so that so you can... So what is the correct positioning? Because I always thought, it, even watching games, it's bizarre that you, you have to look up through the upright to see if it goes through. I just think if you're off to the side to get a better angle... That you well, can then how do I get that one that's above me? Right. Good point, right? right? Yeah, I'm at a vector. Well, I'm not right. <laughs> I, hey, I think you should just run a net because if it goes through the, the, the uh, goalpost, it hits the net it's it, you know it's good right but that's my thought what, what is the best positioning what we um i will stand directly under the crossbar okay and you know so that i've got it right here um i'm going to watch the ball come up and i got it right here and i can turn and pivot and look and then i can see does the ball cross under me or above me okay some guys will step back a step so either way we are on the cross we're on the 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 upright the upright in the crossbar and we're looking for you know, where does that ball cross? Let me ask you this. When you guys see a call that you know is not the right call and you guys get together because you have a good crew mm -hmm. and you guys get together, how tough is that to go to your buddies and say, look, I saw it differently. I I'm telling you that was the wrong call. Or, or how do you do it? I guess well, that's a better question. Okay. So first of all, we talk about approach. Okay. We are all proud to be what we are. And when you come running at me and say that's the wrong call, I think about that all you're, the time, going, yeah. you're going to first of all, you're going to you're, you're you get defensive. Drum, yeah, you're yeah. drumming up my defensive yes. nature. So we go back to the discussion we had earlier when you guys were asking about the defenseless player. I'm going to come into you and I'm going to go, Danny. What did you see? What do you have here? And you're going to tell me what you had, and I'm going to say, um, this is what I saw. If you're adamant, and you and I cannot agree. We're going to stay with your call. Then we're going. Our white hat's going to make the decision, oh, okay. and we're probably going to stay with your call. You know, mm -hmm. and one of the things we don't ever want to do, and we've been guilty of it in the past, and we've worked hard on it, is we don't want to argue on the field. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, we may we may right. cuss each other out and throw crap in the <laughs> locker room at each other and stuff like that. But on the field, somebody's going to make a call. And in most cases, what's going to happen is if you believe that you had the right call, then you're the one that's going to live with it. Now, the unfortunate thing is, is the other four of us are also going to take the brunt of whether you made the right or wrong call. I mean, it's a camaraderie. Nobody goes, nobody goes and looks at the crew and goes, he was a great official. Those other four guys are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, right, it's either right. you all are terrible or you all are pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're kind of, it's, it's like you're all the captain of the ship, and if it sinks, you all are going with it. <laughs> so one of the worst things of, of, about coaching, uh, and, you know, uh, you go to a party, right? And people would always ask questions. Hey, what would you do here? What would you, you know, what'd you think of that? Is it the same thing with officials? Like people find out you're at a party watching a game and they find out you're an official and then they just start peppering you with questions. Like, yeah. will you come on our podcast so we can ask you a bunch of questions? <laughs> right. Miles is like, you got a guy. I, go, I got a guy, but he's going to bring it. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Um, yeah, they'll ask. I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything else. And, you know, the, uh, some, they'll ask you what game you had and if there's somebody that's spectacular in that game or whatever I've been very fortunate to do oh my goodness uh, a numerous state finals numerous semifinals and had plenty of guys that were that are in the NFL now or uh, played at division one that on the field with and, and that's kind of one of the things that was really cool um one of the, I mean, one of the ones that I remember, Zach Boren was really, I oh, mean, yeah. he, he would, when we had him, he was playing middle linebacker at that time. And the team they were playing was running, uh, was running toss sweep and pulling the play side guard. And he's shooting the gap from eight yards deep oh, wow. and making a tackle for a loss on that uh on that play, and that's special. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but he did come out in the second half, and he looks at me and goes, hey, if you could see your way just giving us one call, we could, you know, I could get tickets or something for you. <laughs> just, <laughs> just kidding around. I mean, he said, you know, that's like, no, dude, uh, we can't. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So, <laughs> dude, we, we can't do that. Um, you know, uh, Braxton Miller was probably one of the fastest I had ever seen. We, we had uh, – them versus Cincinnati Elder when he was a junior down in the pit, which is a if, if you've never been to a game there, go because it's phenomenal atmosphere. Elder Purple Panthers, yeah. Yeah, he uh, he um, ran that zone read, and the linebacker in front of me who was going to Indiana at the time took a step to his left, and he pulled it out and went right 66 yards, and it was the fastest thing I had ever seen. Nice. Wow. Um, you know, so a lot of those things. We had uh, Menor and St. Ignatius when Trubitsky was a senior, okay. and that game was 57 to 55 in cool. triple overtime. Wow. Um, just, I mean, it, 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 and some of that stuff is very fortunate. Wow. Uh, we have wonderful football around here, not quite at that Division One level. I mean, that's a real special, and you'll see that with what you have this yeah. Friday night. Yeah. Um, but that's a real special thing that we don't quite get to see around here, that size and speed of athlete. Um, but what we have around here are really, really well fundamentally sound kids, the kids that do it the right way. And, you know, they play hard and, and they're they're respectful. And, you know, it's 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 been a good experience for me. Who do, who who's your all time favorite player that you watch and you were like this this kid is just amazing. I know you talk about Braxton Miller and, and Boren and some of those guys. As far as I, I you mean, when I was officiating, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you the the one that was the most fun that I still laugh about this today was a kid from Crestview who played for Ball State and his name's Os Orsborn, yeah, Briggs yeah, Orsborn, yeah. because I can still remember it vividly because I laughed so darn hard. He came through the line. They were playing. I think they were playing Spencerville, and we were up there. And, he, you know, he's a really good running back. And he comes through the line, and the middle linebacker just belts him. I mean, wraps him up and drives him to the ground. And the whole time going down, he's yelling about how great that hit was. And he jumps <laughs> up, and he goes, gives him five and goes, that's a great hit, and goes back to the huddle. And I'm like, 
<laughs> that kid's having fun. That is, I mean, that's, that's one of the funny, because most kids, when they get popped, they want to go back, and he's giving, he's giving this kid all the props in the world. It's still the, one of the funniest lines I've ever heard from a kid when, is when he did that. And so, you know, that would be one that, that yeah. sticks out in my mind. I mean, there's been great players. They're just too numerous to count, yeah. you know, and, and the great games. Um, you know, they to triple overtime. Menor and had Menor and Moeller in the Division One final in thirteen, and it was fifty-five to fifty-two. Uh, that and was you had that game. Yeah, we had oh, that wow, game. Wow. That would um, be awesome. I was fortunate enough to be on that game. Yeah, so you know, and all around, and we used to travel up to Cleveland and do games. We don't travel as much anymore in the playoffs. Um, uh, OHSAA wants to kind of limit the traveling expense because. In the playoffs, we get paid mileage, so oh. we get a little bit of a bonus when we do playoff games and things like that. So, yeah. well, Jim, we really appreciate you coming this in today. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I could sit here all night and talk. This is awesome, but uh, we really appreciate you coming in. Dude, no problem. I appreciate you asking me, and I hope that I answered the questions that you had and got through what you needed because I have a tendency to be long-winded once in a while. <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're on Danny a lot. Yeah. Um, a lot. Every time I hear Jim Epperly, I'm going to think of pow. From yeah, now on, right? Yeah. Oh, don't do and that. And he's still going to complain about every fun call of. he ever sees. So, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but you guys on your broadcasts, you can do that. And do me one favor. Sure. Okay. And this is this is what I do with my with my officials in our rules meetings and stuff. There is no such foul as offsides in high school. Encroachment. It's encroachment. encroachment. All right. <laughs> hey, guys, I get it in the hallways every week. If, if I'm doing good or bad, I get it, and I love it because I, I seek him out. This is my mentor. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Coach. Yep. Really Thank you, guys. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Jim. Mm-hmm. Charles River, dedicated to improving life by discovering new therapies and cures for devastating diseases. We are a strong supporter of our local community as well as educational opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math throughout Allen County region. Learn more about Charles River at criver.com. Hulker Drywall and Plastering. Hulker Drywall is a family-owned company that is focused on giving every customer the personal attention that they deserve. Utilizing a local workforce, Hulker Drywall is dedicated to bringing professional atmosphere to any commercial or residential job site and is committed to a safe working environment for its employees and customers. What a great interview with uh, Jim Epperly, official here in Northwest Ohio. Just a fantastic job. And, man, I, I learned a lot, guys. I, there was a lot of stuff to unpack there, and he did a great job of helping us out. Pow! That was oh, amazing, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, it clears up a lot. For it us. really does. All right, guys, let's do the Diamond Dave Bowen best thing we saw all week. I love that <laughs> intro, Miles. I'm glad you put that on there. Dave Bowen, one of our best friends at WSN, and it is the Diamond Dave Bowen best thing we saw all week. Yeah, because Dave said there's so many, right? So let's make <laughs> right? it best things. Yeah. Um, Ken Schreiner, 200 wins at OG, uh, got it last week. Congratulations on that. that what a great career. They've mm. averaged like seven wins a year since he took over, I want to say in 96. Um, um, so that's a great thing to see. Um, the atmosphere at Bath when I was there yeah. last Friday. Uh, I was there a couple years ago, and it was a little bit of a ghost town going yeah. into a game, right? Mm-hmm. Not the case now, man. They had a tailgate party. That I was there an hour and a half before kickoff, and <laughs> everybody in Bath was there getting ready for the game. It was fantastic. So good uh, good to see the people in Bath. Uh, Jack Raider, have you seen this guy play for Bath? He's really good. Oh, my Lord, number 99. He is a dude. Had the huge sack to seal the victory for them Friday night. Uh, he was outstanding. Um, Tenora Volleyball, um, if you guys get a chance to watch them play volleyball, it's kind of fun because it's old school. They're going to set the middle. The middle hitter, they got two giant middles, and they're just going to pound the middle all night long. Kind of old school volleyball, fun to see, right? Um, but one of the other things I saw that was fantastic this week, I, I called the Albion and Bluffton uh, college football game uh, this past Saturday. Here's an old name for uh, LCC people, Evan Unruh. Remember oh, Evan? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. he came yeah. in as the second quarterback for Bluffton. Uh, they're still kind of battling, figuring out who's going to be the quarterback. I'm here to tell you, 
co- Coach Nardo. It should be Evan Unruh. Give him the job. He was fantastic running under offense for mm-hmm. the Beavers. Nate, the best thing you saw all week? Yeah, so uh, I'm kind of piggybacking off of your bath love, man. That that bath win over Kenton, um, what a huge victory that was it for was. them. They moved to 3-0 in the Western Buckeye League for the first time since 1999. That is a different style of team. Well, I saw them a couple of weeks ago against Shawnee, and I was sold. Their receivers are big. Ooh. The quarterback good. is so good. Um, you know, this is a different Bath Wildcat yeah, team. Is. Coach Russell has done a fantastic job with them. So it was good to see that win out of them. Uh, Boog Wilson from Lima <laughs> oh, Senior. Yeah. Uh, the the, uh, the passing offense over at Lima Senior right now is the number one in the state. Yeah. Boog Wilson is leading all receivers, no matter what division, in receiving. Fellas, he is averaging 225 yards a game in total offense. That's craziness. Isn't it is it? insane what of, he is yeah. doing right now. 68 of Lima Senior's 176 points have come from Boog Wilson. Whoa. He has a comp- almost half of their offense has been him alone. What he's doing is fantastic. And I'll tell you what, if he keeps up with this pace, you're going to be talking about Boog Wilson in the running for Mr. Ohio football. And I don't know Ooh, if that's ever it. happened in it. this area. Like, I mean, what he's doing right now is just it's record setting. It's so good. And uh, uh, one more for me from football. Walpaw gets the win over St. Mary's. Big win. It was a great thing. That's not the greatest thing, though. Okay. My great thing is that Walpaw got that victory with only having nine minutes and nine seconds of time of possession. St. Mary's had 33 minutes of time of possession. Walpaw got the ball for nine minutes, and they still won 28-14. That is phenomenal. Well, they had some quick strikes. They scored an 80-yard right out of the gate. They had a kick return down to the three. But you, you win the game. And you barely touched the ball. It was fantastic. Um, and outside the uh, football world, I could give a I could give a shout out to my Lima Senior soccer team, assistant coach on that team. Got a big victory the other night against Spencerville. We shut them out four 0 oh, First time we've beaten them in a while. Kicking awesome. it, so, kicking it. Yeah. yeah, good job. Yeah. Wow, that's wow. Great, wow. What do you do? <laughs> why? Like everything cool I just said, you had to go and ruin. I'm no, kicking it because it's soccer. Yeah, no, we got it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I get a kick yeah. out of soccer. Oh I see gosh, what you did. You did. Hey, I just got news. A boog just scored again against North yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. Well, and now, you know, things, they, they get into that TCAL schedule starting this week as well. I got a feeling. Not the track? Bowser comes yeah, in. Not the track. <laughs> it's the TCAL. And I got a feeling that we're going to continue to see Bug score every yeah. three seconds. Yeah. So, Fellas, I had a great game this weekend. Uh, we joked about me going back to Waynesfield to where I work. Uh, we weren't joking. <laughs> it, was, it was serious. Waynesfield Hard Northern was a fantastic game. 21-20. Hard Northern wins it. They score with a minute 10 or so to go. Waynesville drives down the field. They they get stopped on fourth and whatever from about the 15-yard line. But not only that, guys, the reception we got when we got there, because we had not been there in a long time, and we went in there, and these people, they – Look, the, the PA announcer said, hey, WSN is here tonight. They started clapping for us. I really? mean, they were so excited that we were there. I've been there recently. They didn't clap when I was there. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, Hometown Hometown I think it's yeah. a Danny Holbrook yeah, thing. <laughs> but, uh, Danny Holbrook is here. <laughs> Nathan Sweeney, the athletic director, Josh Spencer, the high school principal, they treated us like kings. The community was so excited for us. Uh, they didn't get the win, uh, but guys, if you get a chance to go down there and do a football game. It was you and uh, Gilly. That did Darren game, Gilbert, right? yeah. Did he scare anybody? He did. He oh, scared okay. small children. Right. They hey, were listen, I've said it him, several yes. times. You guys have heard me. There's big time, and then there's Danny Holbrook oh. calling a Waynesville Goshen <laughs> yes. big time. Those are two different worlds. Brought to you by Lee's. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's good fantastic. Stuff. That's real good stuff, guys. All right, let's do this. Let's take a look at week five matchups on WOSN, guys. We got some great games. I'm so excited. I love this segment. Let's start with you, Miles. Game one, Bath and Elida, the three and one Wildcats. We've already talked about the rejuvenation of that program, taking on Elida. Look, Elida's really down right now. You, you, you know this is a rivalry game. It's crosstown kids. They all know each other. Some of them are related to each other. Randy Roberts and you, Miles Holiday, on the call for this game. Yeah, and excited to get uh, Bath and Elida. What a great rivalry. Uh, one yeah. of the best rivalries in the area, right? But you brought it up, Danny. It is a little bit befuddling. This Elida it team, I, if you would have told me they'd be 1-3 and three at this time, I would say, well, what happened? Right, right. right. Uh, this can't score points. And you're wondering, why can't they score points? 
points. Uh, they got talent on that side. Amari Wash, you got to get him the football. And you look at Bath, Danny, they score points in bunches, don't they? Uh, it's crazy how easy they can score the football. Why? You hit it, right? Jake, well, Jack, or Jake Welsh, the quarterback, is fantastic. Had him last week. Um, what he does with his legs, extending plays, is fantastic. But he's not a quarterback that will just take off and run with it. He keeps his eyes up, right? Mm-hmm. He buys extra time, keeps his eyes up. But uh, Mikey Hale, what a great running back for him, for them. They, this is a very explosive team. But do they play defense at Bath, right? That's the thing. That, that's, right? the, that's the only real question they still have to answer, they, whether they, or not that defense will hold up. They did. Um, second half last week against Kenton, they played a much better defense. They said, we're going to lock up, play man, and we're going to bring Kennard on some blitzes. And I thought they found a little bit of a formula there mm-hmm. being aggressive. If I'm Bath, I move forward doing that. And then well, don't forget about our guy, right? The Crim Reaper yeah, the for Crim Elida. Yeah. Now, I thought it was real interesting uh, what uh, OG did last week. Did you see what they said? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to run the opposite yep. side. You put yep. Parker Crim here, we're going to call it on the line of scrimmage, we're going to run left. You wonder if Bath is going to do something similar. Yeah, you know, this is going to be a great game. And, you know, I had a chance to talk to Zach Welsh earlier this week, and, you know, he said that the team that he looks forward to playing the most is Elida. And the environment that he enjoys playing the most in when he's not at home is at Elida. He is ready to go for this game. And with what he's been putting up so far this year, coming off another 300-plus game this past week against Kenton, um, you know, I think that he is poised to have a huge game. I said it earlier in the season, you know, as Ryan Magoo goes, the Elida Bulldogs go. And that really is holding true as Ryan has really struggled over the last couple of weeks. He hasn't found that rhythm and that touch that we saw him have last year. I don't know if it's lingering effects from the injury last year or just, a, you know, he's not having as much time or what's going on. He just doesn't look like does, the same right. quarterback that we saw last year when they were hitting it on all strides. So we'll see. If they can get Ryan Magoo righted and he can start throwing the ball, we know that there are weapons, like you just said, oh, that yeah. they can run the ball, they can throw the ball. Ryan has a, a great touch on the football. That's going to be the key, though, whether or not Coach Harmon can get Ryan Magoo right and get Eli back on uh, the, back on the right track. The one thing that I really do like about Zach Welch, other than him moving his legs around right and creating extra time, he understands his receivers. He's got big receivers outside, so where does he throw it? He puts it in spots where they can only go get it, right? Yep. He does a great job of throwing a ball in a catchable spot for his receivers. Yeah, and you look at this matchup, fellas, and look, I'm not putting down past coaching uh, administrations at math, but – tell me coaching doesn't matter this guy's brought you talk about changing the culture and rejuvenating yep. a program you said it best not just the program us the community oh absolutely. everybody's on board with this guy 100%. And, and look i've got bath walk in a few weeks i'm telling you guys they're going to go into that wapak game undefeated in the wbl and, and, and I don't know that they can beat Wapakoneta, but they're going to play a factor I, I in deciding you, who wins the score. Some points. Listen, yeah. I can I can say this much, Danny. Yeah. Their offense can beat Wapak. It's whether or not that their defense, defense yeah. can hold Wapak. Great, great that point. offense will be up for that task. But yeah. one, one thing that they'd love to do there, too, is a, the motion hail out. And I would caution him from doing that because as a defensive coordinator, right, when Hale's in the backfield, I'm terrified because he could go left, he could go right, they're going to hand the ball off to him, right? If they motion him out and he goes all the way to the sideline, I know where he's going to get the football. Right, right. They, they'll take a look. If there's nothing open, they'll dump it out to him. Now I've got him corralled against that sideline, which I can use as a defender. Yeah, he's he's a difficult one to try to to try to scheme against. But you know, they they have three guys currently in the top ten in the Western Buckeye League in receiving. Yeah. Mikey Hale was in there prior to this past week. He's just on the outside looking in. When he gets the ball in his hands, even as a receiver, he's crazy dangerous. It plays a lot bigger than 157. Yeah. 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 Van Werp goes to Wapakoneta. Patrick Kamler and Jerry Snodgrass on the call. Wapakoneta takes down St. Mary's last week. They separate themselves from the rest of the league. Look, Van Wert, they've got a lot of rebuilding to do. They lost a lot of really good players a couple years ago. Any chance they compete with Wapakoneta this weekend? You know, it's hard because what Van Wert team are we going to get? Right. Right, Week week one and week two, this was a Van Wert team that looked every bit as good and explosive offensively as they did last year. Because that was the big question. You graduated 11 starters on offense, 10 on defense. They had been through that before and they had been okay. Was this team going to reload or were they in a rebuild? Well, weeks one and week two, 48 points, 37 points the next week. Hey, we're in a reload. This is great. Back-to-back weeks now, though, have only been held to 14 points. If this offense 
can't get going and they're going to struggle. Briston Wise hasn't been able to uh, put up the type of numbers that we're seeing. Micah Cowan finally looked human last week after putting up 27 catches for over 300 yards in back to back weeks. He's held to four catches for 35 yards. If this offense is starting to sputter, they're not going to be able to hang with Walpock. Now, if they can find their footing and they can get back to doing what they do so well, throwing the ball over the top, putting up those big yardage games, they can stay in it. And I think that's going to be the recipe. If any team in the Western Buckeye League wants to try to beat Walpock this year, it's going to be, can we win a shootout? Yeah, that's a great you, point. Yeah, I don't know if anybody in the Western Buckeye League is built for that because we like we do, already talked about was you know Walpock held the ball for nine minutes and still managed to beat St. Mary's. Like they know they have big play potential. Their numbers don't look gaudy, but it's because they're efficient. Caleb Moyer is throwing nine passes a game, completing seven of them for 180 yards and right. three touchdowns. Right. right, like these that's efficiency and that's why they're winning. And I. You know, right now, Walpock is the class of the WBL. I would agree with that. Um, he did de- pre- reference um, the first week when Van Wert got a win over, I would say, be careful. That's a really bad Brian team that they yeah. beat, right? Yeah. So it's tough to get any kind of gauge off of that. Now, Coach Recker, he's got to be scratching his head. He's a defensive guy, and you take a look at how many points they're given. <sighs> you could say, Danny, though, they are improving. Three weeks ago, gave up 43. Two weeks ago, 42. Last week, only 41. So they yeah, are getting things, better, things right? Happen. That's a yeah. glass half full guy right yeah, there. Yeah. He's not listening to this podcast. <laughs> I, I, he won't be anymore. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey, Coach does a great job there. But, yeah, it's going to be a tough ask because you're giving up all kinds of points. Nate talked about how great they, they can be on offense, number two in the WBL offensively. But you take a look at the defensive stats, dead last, right? That is a bad formula going against a very powerful Wapa connect a team the only chance is if Briston Weiss as Nate said goes crazy right it's gonna have to be better than 11 of 21 for 108 and an interception that he had last week but he is a dual threat guy 23 carries for 100 yards last week if he can go crazy they can stay in this football game get to the second half but I think it's gonna be a tough time Caleb Moyer right the the quarterback really good yeah when are we gonna start talking about him as one of the best in Northwest Ohio right I don't think he gets the attempts that that he he that's exactly stats, why. It's right. because he's yeah. not putting up right, 500 right, yards right, a game. Yeah. But it's because that's not what they need. Nope, he's so nope. efficient. It's yeah. it's crazy his efficiency and how much he gets overlooked. But I'm telling you right now, that kid for my money is the best third and whatever quarterback. He is magic on third down. I love the way they do things. I love the way his dad runs that whole program over there. They just yeah. reload every year. They are so good at putting people in spots. They lose really. Th- look, they lost Joey Truesdale last year, who was a fantastic linebacker, and they just reload. They just put another kid in. But you know what they do in the offseason? They work. They sure do. They work hard. They get in the weight room. They get 50, 60, 70 kids in there, and that's the way it gets done. Danny, Travis Boyer does a great job with their mindset, right? Yeah. Going for four WBLs in a, in a row, mm-hmm. and he just says, well, this is just another step, right? Yeah. Oh, we won Friday. Okay, next week's going to be another step. Uh, but it does help to have a guy by the name of Grant Hauser, one of the best <laughs> tight ends one, yeah. in Ohio, right? Yep. Watch a little bit of that game last week. Of course, everybody gets recruited as a tight end because you catch the football right much better blocker than i anticipated he is a dude at the tight end position miles game three cold water at minster diamond dave bowen and jack mcguire on the call look this there's there's a couple games in the mac that are really good this week for my money this may be the game of the week both these squads undefeated i like to say this is for second place but you never know you never know cold water minster look they've got a shot that's all i'm going to say but they play each other this week this is really tight right because you look at cold water they're going to score over 30 right you look at minster they're probably going to score over 30 as well you look at them defensively cold water only gives up about 10 minster only gives up about 14 a game so you go common opponent well let's look at Anna they played each other 41 14 41-14, Forty-one, fourteen, <laughs> right? So it's really tough to try to figure out who's going to win this one. But I'd like cold water because Braylon Blockberger, the guy is so good. He just completes passes. That's all he does, just completes passes. And Mason Welch is a huge target Do for Do you him. guys know this in doing my prep? I looked at the last couple of years. They haven't played each other in two years. Mm-hmm. That, I, I just think these it, kids it, have not hit each other in two years. Yeah, it, which is yeah. weird because I, right. when I started watching or doing the same thing, I, I – I don't know if I just never knew. I don't know if I forgot. I didn't even realize that the Mac doesn't right. play everybody. I, every I didn't year. either. Right. I, yeah. I was taken aback by that. But listen, this for my money is 
going to be the game of the year so far. Yeah, I think I that agree. this is a conference eliminator game. Whoever loses this game is done because it's going to take right, an undefeated right, record right. to win the MAC. You have to go undefeated, right? And I picked Minster. They are my prediction to win the MAC this year. I think that they have some unfinished business. Brogan Steffi had an injury last year He's that cost such him a good his, athlete. He is coming off of a five touchdown game. Mm-hmm. He is leading the MAC in rushing. Okay, his running back is top five. They can run the ball. They move the ball. Numbers are incredible, but they're also only playing a half of football most night or most Friday yeah. nights. I think that this Minster team is legitimate. I think that they are for real. I think that they are getting overlooked a little bit, and I think they're going to lean on that going into this cold water game. I agree with you. Blockberger is phenomenal. He is such a good athlete, but. You're talking about Brogan Steffi, who is leading the conference. He's the top quarterback, top rusher. I mean, he is right now the standard for the MAC at the quarterback position. For my money, I think he's the best athlete in the MAC, football, basketball, every sport he plays. Well, it's going to be important that his guys up front identify who the blitzer is because we know Coldwater loves to be a three front and then bring people, right? And they'll even include Mason Welch, who led them in tackles last year from the safety position to come fly up. So if they can figure out who's coming as a secondary blitzer from Coldwater and they can allow him to get out to the perimeter, that's their shot, right? Well, and I and I kind of, I, you know, I know you, you were talking about over 30 a game. I, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be the defense as settled settle this yeah. one. I think that you're talking you know you're talking about a cold water team that only gives up 127 yards a game. Right. These defenses are phenomenal. I think this one comes down to what defense ends up with the more timely stop. And I, I think we could be looking at a low scoring defensive battle. Well, third down is going to be huge then. Yep. Well, if you don't like that, guys, in the in the MAC, all you got to do is look where Garrett Seawright and Mark Shine are going to be calling the game. New Bremen at Marion Local. It doesn't get much bigger than that. Both these squads, unbelievable. Everybody knows the history of Marion Local. Any chance for New Bremen this weekend? So you guys said that not everybody plays each other in the MAC, right? Can right. you request that? Uh, can we not have Marion <laughs> Local? <laughs> That's what we kind of joked when yeah, I heard right. that. I was talking to a friend. We kind of joked to that. Like they just don't want to, have to play Marion Local every yeah. year. Who wants to? Right? What right. a monster! Seventy. One nothing last week over DSJ. Danny, they have only given up 15 points all year. Now, you say uh, New Bremen, uh, you, you championed them last week, how mm-hmm. good they are defensively. And this, it's good. true, right? They're yeah. really good. They've only given up 31 points all year long, but they just have a tough time scoring the football. I think that's going to be a big problem. Might be one of those games, Nate, that it's at halftime, it's a little bit close, but Marion Local is going to be able to score some and points. And it's at Marion Local, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I really like this New Bremen team. I think come tournament time you're going to see a heck of a run out of the Cardinals um, I, I, I talked about them last week I did like them they came within a two-point conversion away from knocking yeah. off for sales right. they, they were in that game but you're right they do not score for any points nope. and you guys know what the, uh, the 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 record right now for Marion local New Bremen is all time oh. uh, f- they played 50 times 40-10. This is this is one of those one-sided battles. Sorry, Cardinals. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know now there was a, a win recently. They did win in twenty twenty. Um, right. So, you know they they there are some people in that community who are like, oh, we and I think I didn't do the research, but I saw that I think that was the last, last time match. Marion local lost, and it was in the playoffs. Do you guys like it when coaches go for two to to try to end the game to win a, it as against the defending saying, state runner up who yeah. are undefeated and yeah, top? I yep, I yep. Do. I think Absolutely. I think that was the right call to make. Right. Um, right. It, you know, it was, uh, and the play was there too. I, you know, I somebody told me what the play was and how it kind of all went down, and it was there. It just seems like you Mike, know, just yeah. came up a little bit My short. Kids are but want to know that I want them to win. Mm. I don't yep. want to settle for anything other than a win. Yeah, so, I, as much as I want to believe in New Bremen, um, I don't think they're able to win this one. And mainly, it's more about a belief in Marion Local until someone beats them. I'm not going to ever think that are they, they ever can lose. lose again? Exactly. They are. They're bearing <laughs> down on the on the all time yeah. Ohio record that Delphi St. John's currently holds. That's yeah. in the upper. 50s if they they finish the season undefeated they will own that record so I think that you know as much as you know that stuff doesn't usually come into the minds of Marion Local I do think that that's on the radar down there they're not going to have a hiccup here I think that the defense for New Bremen will keep this one close um I think it'll be a lot closer than people probably anticipate, but ultimately Marion Local wins this one. Let me ask you this, one. Nate. If it's a two-score game, is that a is that a moral victory for New Bremen? It should be. Hey, right. That's yes, what I'm uh, going yeah. yeah. I mean, without a doubt. You tell your kids, look, we just took them toe-to-toe. Yep. Yeah. And you're not going to see a more difficult team in, in the playoffs, so 
let's yeah. go. Hey, moral victories are nice, but they're still L's. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, myself and Darren Gilbert have a big one this weekend. Bell found at Indian Lake. And the notes here say, Danny, try not to drool all over Tavian St. Clair. <laughs> weird. None of us knew yeah. that you were going to do this game, Danny. Yeah, right. You, you, like, wow, this is such a shock. We're hearing about this for the we're hearing about this for the first time. Yeah, and no, I didn't have to give Nick any money for this. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, look, we all know Tavian St. Clair, the number one player, not in the state of Ohio, the number one player in America. Guys, Miles knows my, for, my, my love for this kid. He is a special athlete. We've not seen anything like this in a long time. Um, you look at his stats, guys. First off, he's 6'4", 228 pounds. Um, he's 53 of, th- of 84, guys, for 945 yards, 11 touchdowns, and two interceptions. He's, you watch him play. You know when you see a kid on the field that's Division One, he's different. Mm-hmm. When you see the number one player in the country, you, you, it's real different. You think those yeah. two interception balls are in someone's house? Because I'd, be like, <laughs> I'd be like, give it here yeah. right now. That's going home with me. Yeah. I intercepted him. I just him, took an NFL player. And I'm going to hold it when he's at the Heisman Trophy <laughs> ceremony going, look what I did. Yeah. And, it, and, guys, it couldn't be a different uh, kind of game. You, you look at Indian Lake, and they love to run the ball. They go for 163 yards a game. They only pass for 80 game, a game, guys. This one, well, that, I, I don't want to say it could get ugly, but th- this one, you know, you better be able to pass the ball a little bit against Belfont. So, so Belfont is going to score forty. Right? Oh, easy, easy, yeah. Uh, Indian Lake's not going to get there, right? No. no. Yeah, and and how do you stop Tavian Sinclair? Well, you, you have to get pressure, right? Uh, Indian Lake only five sacks all yeah. year long. Uh, I've only intercepted three passes. Now, Danny, if you were playing against Tavian and you intercepted a pass. For 30 years after that, you would be telling everybody, oh, I accepted oh, yeah. Tavian Weekly, St. Clair. I'm telling yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Weekly. Right, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I actually I think it's a little different. How are you going to beat Tavian St. Clair? Don't let Tavian St. Clair have the ball. Oh, sure. great and at yeah. least Indian Lake has that in their game script, yeah. right? Like, they're a running team. Yeah. We talk about it with St. Mary's. Now, it didn't stop them from losing this last week, right? Having the ball for 33 minutes of gameplay. But that's going to have to be Indian Lake's you know, MO. If they're going to try to keep themselves in this one and give themselves a chance, they're going to have to grind the clock. They're going to have to speed this game up and mm-hmm. keep Tavion St. Clair off the field as much as they possibly he, can. He, he's one of those guys, when you're watching film, I always say that they, they have a force field, meaning that you, they're almost in, you can't tackle them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you remember Terrell Pryor when he played? You know, he just would run around guys. People would fall off him. They have a force field. Tavion St. Clair, same type of guy. He's Terrell Pryor but can throw the football. Absolutely. And you, you look at Indian Lake and Madden Lowe the quarterback. Uh, he's 29 of 58 for 322 yards. They don't throw the ball a lot, as I said, but he does run the ball effectively. And then Drake Cosby, the running back, he's got 273 yards and four touchdowns. He averages 68 yards a game. They're going to have to put up much bigger numbers to be able to keep the ball on the field and score. Look, Indian Lake wins this game if it's 21-17. You know, right. they don't yeah. win this thing yeah, at 40. No. To, or, yeah. or, I mean, like, they win this game, you know, by Tavion not coming. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. I mean, he's like, oh, you know what? I got? I didn't. I missed. I missed the bus. I'm not yeah. gonna say. I'm not gonna start the broadcast out Friday night with that at all. <laughs> well, you know, it could be one of those situations too, where a guy catches a pass and it gets stripped out from behind, and Ian Lake gets yeah, a break. They're gonna really that one or two. Yeah. yeah um, Cyrus Cummins, a linebacker for them, fantastic with 11 tackles per game. It's gonna take. You know, the perfect game for Indian Lake to yeah. win on Friday. You know, they've got a kid by the name of Braylon Newcomb, 33 receptions this year, 641 yards and 10 touchdowns. That's what he didn't have last year. He's got a go-to number one receiver, and they're just exploding. Yeah, yeah he, he nukes yeah. them. Yeah, they're unbelievable. <laughs> Charles River, dedicated to improving life by discovering new therapies and cures for devastating diseases. We are a strong supporter of our local community as well as educational opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math throughout Allen County region. Learn more about Charles River at criver.com. Hulker Drywall and Plastering. Hulker Drywall is a family-owned company that is focused on giving every customer the personal attention that they deserve. Utilizing a local workforce, Hulker Drywall is dedicated to bringing professional atmosphere to any commercial or residential job site and is committed to a safe working environment for its employees and customers. All right, guys, great high school football segment, but let's go up to the big boys. Let's talk National Football League. Miles, who has impressed you through two weeks either a player or a team 
Tell me who it is. Uh, it's got to be the Saints, right? They scored on really 14 good. straight yeah. drives with Derek Carr at quarterback. Who would have thought before the season that they would be that prolific on the offensive side of the football? The Saints are a scary team right now. Yeah, they've been doing a good job. For me, it's been Baker Mayfield. I know there's oh, a lot yeah. as, so as Cleveland Brown fans in the area. You know, there's been a lot of jokes going back and forth, but only because of what he's been able to do down in Tampa Bay. He has looked really good. He's back to that Baker that I think everybody thought he had the potential of being. He looks comfortable. He, he's moving that offense well. He has playmakers around him. I, I really enjoyed watching him these first two weeks. That running touchdown against the Lions that he had, that was all grits and gut and determination, wasn't it? Nope. It was fun to watch. For me, it's J.K. Dobbins. I, oh, look, we're yeah. seeing J.K. Yeah. Dobbins, what he was at Ohio State. I'm telling you right now, when J.K. Dobbins signed with the Chargers and they hired Jim Harbaugh, he had to be throwing a party for himself. This is the exactly the kind of offense that this kid needs to run in. Yep. We make fun of Jim Harbaugh all we want, but you said it best. The guy just wins. And they run the football and they win. And J.K. Dobbins, if he stays healthy, he's going to have a monster year. Something oh, yeah. about Jim Harbaugh being an ex-quarterback, right? You think his teams yeah. for years would be throwing the football. But that guy knows how to implement running offenses, nope. doesn't he? Yeah. Everywhere he goes, Stanford, even at San Diego before that and at Michigan, running the football is a mindset, and he brings it. Yeah, what's the, uh, what's the most surprising thing to you so far through three weeks? Uh, the Tom Brady and how bad he is as a commentator, <laughs> right? <laughs> so bad. Is it it's not good. Yeah. Is, is, it, not good. is it bad that I take joy in it, right? <laughs> I mean, he was... Well, it's good to know that he's human, right? Yeah. He can be fine, finally it, bad at and something. And what is really cool yeah, is the guys yeah. from WSN are critiquing the major guys. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because we're yeah, like, oh, they're going to call us next, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but wait, Nick's wait, like, wait. I can't lose these guys. <laughs> I'm confident in saying I'm better at Tom Brady right now, <laughs> but I make nothing close to what Tom Brady <laughs> makes. <laughs> Nate and I are... What, what, yeah. I, no, no, no. That's just the kickback that yeah. Danny gets from Wayne's <laughs> when he goes over. <laughs> Nate, what's the most surprising thing for you so far? You know, to me, it's been this big move, and we've seen this kind of slowly coming into play, but I think over these first two weeks, we've really seen it. It's the move offense is going back to a run heavy offense and getting away from passing the ball you know forever it's been the five wide throw the ball around score the points excitement yeah. blah, and they've they've you've seen this shift the running back position lost importance for so long you saw wide receivers getting drafted in the top five getting away from getting running backs money. and now all of a sudden you know we're, we're putting the running backs back into play they're vitally important to what these offenses do and if you don't have a good running back your team is not doing well right now yeah. It'll be interesting, too, if the fullback makes a resurgence in the NFL, right? Well, on Broadnax, bring him back. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, to me, guys, it's uh, – and every time I do this, I – kick myself in the butt. I underestimate Mike Tomlin and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Every time I do this, here they are, 2-0. and Now, are they are they ugly wins? Yeah, but they're still 2-0, and and they put themselves in a position to be on top of the AFC North. Every year I keep thinking, they're going to falter, they're going to be at the bottom, and here they are on top of the division. Why, why you do this? <laughs> well, like, like, well, well, come on, man. But, but like, a, he's right here. I know. Uh -huh. like, like, he's no, right he got, here. He doesn't listen to anything I say. <laughs> <laughs> Go steal us. Yeah. Yeah. Nate, in your opinion, why is scoring down in the NFL? I think it's honestly just what I just said, right? I think that this move to running has um, slowed that scoring down. And then when they do pass it, the offensive lines in the league are horrible. Yeah, I good. mean, I am not seeing the, the um, uh, investment in the offensive lines that I think that we've seen. I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know if it's a, a talent pool issue. But you watch these games, and these offensive lines just do not look very good for the majority of the teams. Well, what does that result in? Not having the ball for very long, no long sustained drives, you know, a lot of turnovers, quarterbacks getting hurt. I, they Teams have got to start realizing that instead of paying $900 million to your wide receiver and quarterback combo, you better start investing in the people who protect them. Mm. Yeah. This will be interesting because uh, he's a big Bengals fan, and they got that. Yeah, I can't imagine why I possibly yeah, right. feel that way. Well, <laughs> I mean, because you guys got that tough decision with uh, Chase at, at receiver, right? He's That's not a tough decision. Just you, pay him. Okay, so what, you pay him. <laughs> you out offered checks. what forty-two million, and he said, "No, that's not enough per year." So you, yeah. you pay him a little bit more. And you're paying your quarterback a ton of money. How are you paying that offensive line that you said that we need to start taking and making sure it's a big priority? You figure it out. <laughs> Listen, if I had the answers, I'd be running the team. I'm just saying, you can't, you know. You're not Mr. Brown. <laughs> I'm not Mr. Brown. That's Guys, right. In my opinion, uh, and, and we've talked about this quite a bit, it's, it's what they did a couple years ago when the NFL devalued the running back. 
everything went to a quarterback-driven league. When you devalue the running back, then you make teams one-dimensional. And I think scoring is down because defenses are getting faster, bigger, better, and I think they're starting to figure out the offenses. I really do. Well, that, but that's why they're also going back. To right. No, 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 and I was going right? to go with that. Like, that when yeah. you said that, that's, that, that triggered in my mind that maybe that's why they're going back to getting guys like J.K. Dobbins and, and guys like Derrick Henry are extending their careers. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you why scoring is down. It has to do with offensive play callers. They ask, you guys both said it, offensive linemen, if you're going to pick the best athletes on the field, they're not the offensive linemen, right? right? However, offensive coordinators will time and time again ask, and Danny, we talked during the week uh, before this podcast, the Browns and the Jaguars, right? What did the Jaguars ask their offensive tackles to do to Miles Garrett? Block them one-on-one over time. Happening. Watch the Steelers and the Broncos last week. Ask them to block JT's, or J- J- TJ's uh, Watt one-on-one on the edge. It's not going to happen, right? It's well, not going to work. Same thing in the right. Lions game. That's what, Aiden Hutchins went crazy. Four and a half sack, right? What happened right. to the line, or What happened to the tight end chipping, yeah. you know, right. helping out? You get all these guys who have their Denny's menu with 80,000 plays on it, mm-hmm. right? And they got to show everybody how smart they are because we got to send five receivers out. And I, I got to have my quarterback put up video game numbers because I'm an offensive genius and I want everybody to see it as opposed to doing what your talent allows you to do right if you have a tackle that can't block uh watt or uh, miles garrett use a tight end go f- max protection here's an idea only send three out on a route and, and max protect those are the things that you don't see in the nfl anymore you know so I, I read this sheet wrong when you sent it out and you sent us the show sheet for today miles i, I was reading through it and we get to this segment and the questions that we're going to things that we're going to talk about at the bottom is you know you say the things that you how you're going to answer right but it's right underneath in your opinion why is scoring down and I read it and I'm like so he thinks scoring down because of the Saints because Tom Brady (laughs) is such a horrible commentator like what is Tom Brady being a bad commentator I was like it's so bad guys like we're not scoring anymore until you get rid of them we're done we can't handle it (laughs) I support that I I was like I can't wait to hear this All right, guys, let's get down to the junior circuit. Let's talk a little college football. Let's talk about our Ohio State Buckeyes. After three weeks of the season, Nate, are there any Big Ten teams that concern you besides Ohio State? We always say that if Ohio State loses, they're going to have to – they'll beat themselves. Any Big Ten teams? Yeah, actually. um, Nebraska is starting to scare me, guys. That's who I have. I'll tell you what, that is a different feel down there, right? Rayola is looking really good. Um, Doesn't look like a freshman, does it? Nope, they are feeling themselves over there. (laughs) Huh, that's that's weird. weird. That's weird. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I I think that Matt Rule is doing a great job down there. There's a lot of confidence running through there. That That is all of a sudden a very scary matchup for Ohio State as they as Nebraska's gonna want to make their mark. Matt Root is putting a lot of emphasis on that game to show that Nebraska is back. And I think that Ohio State really has to circle that one. And the other one is it wouldn't be potentially until the Big Ten championship, but it's USC. I mm-hmm. think that a, a matchup against USC in that Big Ten championship should be a, a scary matchup for the Buckeyes. I'm with you on USC. I think they go up to the big house this weekend and I think they have no trouble with Michigan. I, I think agree. They, they they win that one easy. Um, um, I will caution you on Nebraska a little bit. I'll push back on that one because, I mean, everybody says, oh, they're great because who'd they beat? Colorado, well, right? Fair. Col- right? Colorado yeah. is playing without an offensive line. Um, so that, that, that It's gives- an interesting strategy they're trying. <laughs> they're like, let's see if this works. We yeah. just won't block just anybody. The ball we also won't tackle anybody. Yeah. We'll see if this pays off. And also, I, I'm predicting that Illinois – is going to beat Nebraska this weekend because Illinois terrifies me. We talk about how would Ohio State lose. Nate mentioned this earlier when we were talking about high school football. Don't let them have the football. Running the football, right? Mm-hmm. right. Illinois, old school. Yeah, we're we're going to punch yeah. you in the mouth with uh, Bielema's Wisconsin philosophy. If Illinois keeps running the football and playing great defense, could you imagine Ohio State trying to win a 17-14 game because we don't have the football because Illinois is running it? I'm not losing the Illabuck. To Illinois. No, I'm not that's losing a huge the Illinois trophy, trophy. Isn't it? Yeah. Like, there was so much that just went through my head when you said Illinois, and I started getting flashbacks, and I started seeing the number one team going down. Oh, to oh no, juice. juice. Oh, oh, it, my God. it all just started flooding back. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to push it right out of my yeah. head. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of like Nebraska, too, but here's the thing with Nebraska. It's, it's the numbers game. The quality of depth at Ohio State will, will be far more superior than what they have in Nebraska. Now, the biggest thing that Nebraska did – since Matt Rule's been there, is get a commitment from the number one player in the country, mm-hmm. Dylan Rayola. That, that, that is huge. Well, I think uh, in that game, I think it'll come down to if Nebraska comes out 
and they have success right away, yeah, it, we're in trouble. If they have any confidence in that game, it's going sure. to be. It's going to be. I, I just think with attrition, I, I don't know that they can play four quarters of football with the kind of athletes we have. But but we'll see. What, um, what position does attrition play? Uh, he's the left tackle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Miles. Let me ask you this: You have to pick either. Quinshawn Judkins or Travion Henderson to play as your running back on the game-winning drive. You're picking which one? Well, number one, it's a great choice, right? Oh, my gosh. How did it go wrong? Yeah, yeah, you're right, right. But I'm going to go with Henderson because uh, do you remember the blitz pickup where he stoned Mm -hmm. that guy? Um, You're going down. You're going to be pass-heavy on a game-winning drive. Uh, Defense coordinators are going to start bringing guys. He is a really complete running back, especially because if you can't pick up blitz, you're not getting drafted in the NFL, right? He has shown that he can pick up the blitz. Yeah, yeah so I'm going the other way. I'm picking Judkins. And, and, and honestly, they're both super talented. They, I think they both will help you, but it's for one simple reason. I trust that Junkins won't get hurt halfway down the drive and have to come out of the game. Great. I mean, it's, I mean, it's I, true, isn't I it? Mean, Sadly, you know, it the, is. the, the concern with Henderson is always that durability. And will he be able to be a three down every day and back and all these things? And, you know, I think I, right now, at least, I trust Junkins a little yeah. bit more with Plus, that than I do Henderson. He might just go on a first play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Look, if I have two equal backs like this, and they're both the quality of these two backs, you can't go wrong either way. But on the game winning drive, I'm going to go with the senior. Judkins is a junior. I'm going to go with the senior on this one. You know, it I doesn't just, matter. They're both gone no, next year, I, right? Well, I know, I know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, exactly. So, all right, big noon kickoff. Good or bad? I, I, you have to watch it to know, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that is mean. Oh, oh that's wow. the best answer today. That's pretty good. Isn't it? I guess that's the answer. <laughs> I mean, I really don't know. I don't. I don't watch it. Like, it's yeah. not. If I'm going to watch one of these kickoff shows, I it's turn on game day. Well, I turn on big news. Well, kickoff. what about having the big game at noon? Because that's what Fox does, right? They, yeah. they put they put that big game at noon. What do you think about that, Nate? Having that yeah, big nope, game at I noon. I love. I love that. Do you? Yes. Okay. I think you know that's what. The football is to me. I think that you have one marquee game that should be your eight o'clock kickoff game that the entire country is watching. Everybody else is noon or three thirty. The noon games get all the prime time. Three thirty are your secondary, and that eight o'clock game is the one game in the entire country that everybody wants to see. Yeah, That's you? how it was. That's how it should be. It yeah. bothers me. It that was it's forever, not. right? Yep. Right. Yep. What, what do you think, Danny? Well, I'll say this. Um, I've watched CBS's coverage the last couple of weeks of the Big Ten, and it's awful compared to the SEC. And I'll tell you why. It's the matchups. Look, every Saturday for the last 25 years, I get in watching Big Ten football, I'm watching CBS for an SEC matchup, and I'm getting great games. Like, just great games. Mm -hmm. And we're getting Purdue getting beat by Notre Dame by 67, whatever the score was. Um, But Big Noon kickoff, look, they're still competing with College Game Day. Um, they're, 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 They're all trying to knock off the champ and ESPN College Dame it is but I think Big Noon does a great job I, they have villains they have good guys um, I, I, don't I don't even I, I really don't even know who's on that yeah, broadcast I, well, Urban Meyer uh, Brady Quinn oh okay okay yeah okay but I think they Reggie do Bush. Good, yeah Reggie Bush I don't think they do a bad job I, I'll, give, I'll give them a, a 7 out of 10 how about I, that I think it's a great show because Urban Meyer will give you great analysis right he just doesn't say stuff like oh they got their swag right why are they going to win they got their swag back yeah. I, I hate when they do that mm. stuff. Urban will give you in-depth analysis from a coach's perspective, and you just don't get that on other things. Yeah. Um, plus, there is no Desmond Howard. <laughs> there is no <laughs> Desmond <laughs> Howard <laughs> on this yes. show, right? Yeah. So that, that's a win for me. Now, the game's being kicked off at, at noon. If it's a big game and it's Ohio State, absolutely hate it. I can't stand it unless it's Michigan. Yeah. I would rather kind of salivate over all day long, knowing we're kicking off at night, yeah. having a night game. Ohio State, even when they play the whiteout at Penn State, You thought about it all day long. It's a big-time moment. It's the marquee matchup for everybody on that day. So I'd rather kick off at 730. Mm. I guarantee that the Buckeyes will what, Miles? I got two, actually. Oh, I I guarantee they will beat Oregon. You only get one. (laughs) And... That clown show up in Ann Arbor when we play the third week or fourth week in November, uh, we will d- definitely destroy that team up north. So I got two as well. Yeah, uh, yeah and I didn't until just now, yeah. but I just made one up. Um, <laughs> it's the Dave Bowen uh, rule. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I guarantee, and I'm really going on a limb on here, fellas, so you guys can hold me accountable. Oh, okay, if I get okay, this wrong, we will. Okay. Okay. I'm writing. But I guarantee you that Ohio State covers against Marshall. 
Okay, I like so, that. That's a, I took. I'm taking. I'm taking. I'm, take, I'm yeah, really yeah, out. Okay, out I guarantee they cover against Marshall, and I guarantee at some point this year, Will Howard will lose us a game, and I'll be super angry. And oh, you guys all, and you guys will all have to admit that I was right oh, about Will Howard. Oh, I can't oh, wait. No. I can't. No I, for you. I can't wait. No grippos. Will Howard chips for you. Uh, uh. I guarantee you that the Buckeyes will beat. T-T-U-N this year, lock it, stock it, whatever you have to do. And I have another one, too. I guarantee you the Buckeyes will have another game in the shoe after the Michigan game. Oh, I like that. That will be yeah, interesting. That would be really that, cool. This whole thing. Guys, will, yeah, we, if that so happens, we got to go. It'll be we the hottest go. ticket ever. Oh, right? I know, right? Yeah. 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 Nate's Man, got me. cash. He'll pay. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Media credentials, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Nick, <laughs> yeah. that's right. You know what I'd love? Yeah. If we got a home game and it was against an SEC team oh, and it's like yeah. zero degrees <laughs> in the horseshoe. Wouldn't that, that be would amazing? And I'm not even going to go with your next one. Should Marshall even show up? No. Of course not. Oh, no. Of course not. Yeah, they no. should. What's wrong with you guys? They get seven figures for just walking through the door. <laughs> Why That's would you point. turn down uh, seven <laughs> figures? Yes, they should show up. <laughs> all, right, all right, guys, our last segment of the night, maybe the best segment we all look forward to, our Power 5 football teams in Northwest Ohio. Go ahead, Miles, you start first. All right, so Marion Local. What? Uh, they're going to make it. What? Yeah, they're going to make the oh, list. Oh, those little yeah, fellas yeah, making yeah. your top five? <laughs> Coldwater is on there again. I can't not have Columbus Grove on there keep winning right um i'm gonna add bluffton this week because it looks like columbus grove and bluffton are on that collision course yet again this year don't forget lcc though right so Mm. is it the fifth team is it lcc is it bath is it minster no it's cold water volleyball they're the (laughs) best (laughs) volleyball team in the area undefeated still they are fantastic nate your power five (laughs) uh so so mine surprise marion local columbus grove i think that right now in our area those are the top two teams for everybody to keep their eyes on um, I went with Walpock a big win against um, St. Mary's this past week they just continue to look better and better and better I've had Bluffton on my list for three weeks now they're not going anywhere right and then uh, my my last is who I think is going to pull off a victory this weekend, and that's Minster. I think mm. the Minster Wildcats coming in at five. I love what Steffi brings to that team. I think that they're incredibly dangerous and overlooked, and that makes the team even that much more dangerous. Yeah, my number one team, are you ready for this? It's Marion Local. No. Uh, yeah, I know. Oh, I lost oh, that bet with myself. Lot. Jeez. They've won a few games down in Mercer County. They're I pretty lucky good. I got lucky 52 times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fellas, I got Wapakoneta. I think they're the class of the WBL. I think they're on a collision course, uh, you know, for another WBL yeah. title. Um, so uh, I've got Grove. I think they're the class of the Northwest Conference. And I think that they, again, a collision course with Bluffton. I think both of them are going to come into that game undefeated. I can't wait for that one. Um uh, I've got cold water and I've got Bluffton. So pretty much same top five as everybody else. Yeah, I mean, look, we're getting to the halfway point here of the high school season and so teams fast. are really starting to establish themselves. And, you know, the, the class of, you know, these conferences are really starting to come to the top. And it's making this segment a little bit easier because, sure quite is. frankly, the teams that we identified early, they just keep right on rolling. Yeah. So another three wise men from WSN, the podcast. I want to thank my guys here, Nate Garlock, Miles Holiday, Kelsey Beimer, Nick Fraley. I want to thank our sponsors, Charles River and the Hawker Drywall and Plastering Company. Guys, let's do it again next week. How great was Jim Epperly, too? Oh, Jim Epperly oh, was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Good call. yeah, so let's do it again next week. Let's do it. I won't be here. We'll have a fill-in next week. I got some soccer games I got to go to, so uh, scheduling didn't work out real well. Kick it far, my friend. Kick it far. But, yeah, but I'll be back with you guys here in two weeks. Thanks, everybody.